last added to the introduction to our car is so complicated. Oh, so huge that we could talk for days. Actually, Python provides training the last two days introduction, two days at once. So you see there's a lot about it. This is a very brief introduction what it does. First of all, a question about something completely different. Who likes to do, likes to take pictures? Photography, a hobby, anyway? Hi, oh, Mr. Liu, cool. I like that too. My main uh, subject of is nature photography. And uh, for that I have seven different lenses. For example, for birds, I have a big telephoto lens because birds are shy and you need a big lens to get them big enough in the frame. This is not at all usable for landscape photography, or at least in most cases because you want a wide view with many, many, many mountains in one picture. But this you use a wide angle lens. A wide angle lens is in most cases not a good idea if you want to photograph a grizzly bear, because if you approach a grizzly bear, <laughs> it very likely will run away and you won't get a picture. Less likely, but possible, it will stay, then again, you probably won't get a picture. So, you use different lenses for different subjects because there is no one lens that can do everything. It would be cool to have such a lens, but it's just not possible. The laws of physics have something against it. The same with concurrency. Sometimes you read, oh, I create this new framework or a new company announces a new something and say, this will solve all the concurrency problems. It will be extremely fast, it will be scalable, it will be secure, no more rocks, everything will be perfect. That's bullshit. It also doesn't work. The same with ACCA. ACCA is not your solution for all your concurrency problems. Sometimes you want to be really low level and just with a jumble lump as well and be done with it. In most cases, this is not a good idea, but sometimes you may want to do it. For example, if you want to build something like ACCA, you need something more low level. Same with, sometimes even that may be too high level and you just do C code and act a little scum. Sometimes this may be the best approach. But for many things, ACCA is a very good solution. Actually, ACCA itself has many different ways to do concurrency. They have the ACCA, which we're going to see today. They also have something like software transaction and memory, which is, in my opinion, not very useful in most situations, but sometimes it's maybe exactly what you need. They have stuff like futures, which we won't talk about much, but we'll see how we can combine futures and actors. They work very well together. And you can still, if you need, in some places you can use Akka in your application, still do a little bit outside of Akka, maybe using just Java and to secure the service or even Java logs, right? If you need. Okay, what is access? Um, okay, now let's just. I have a problem because I cannot see those slides on the screen at the moment because the Intel driver for Ubuntu sucks. <laughs> Sometimes when people see Scala or Akka, they say, this is so cool, Java sucks. Well, without Java or the JDK, there wouldn't be any Akka, or at least it would be a lot more difficult to build. As you can see, if you search for Java, you do concurrent in the Akka source code, you have 547 imports. There's a lot of different stuff, in it, like atomic long, concurrent link queues, they execute the service, port join, and a lot of other stuff. This is all necessary to build something like Arca. The same volatile, volatile is often considered to be evil because it's very easy to get um, a bug in your system. But if you know what you're doing, I hope that the Arca can know what you're doing, volatile can be an important tool to make things fast. You shouldn't use volatile within your actor. That would be a bug. But to build something like that, it works. Also, it's built on Scala concurrent, and this is again built on the JPK. So, what the guys introduced with the JVM almost 20 years ago now, and particularly what came with Java 5, Java Little Concurrent, this is now the foundation for almost anything that does concurrency on the JVM, be it Tomcat, JDOS, Cassandra, HBase, or Namak. So, if you don't like the JPK, and you want to think about it again because without the JDK you wouldn't have all those cool things that we have on this car. So what is an actor? Actors is an old idea. It was, I think, the first paper was published in the 60s or 70s. I forgot the name of the guy. Hewitt or something like that. 
and it made, was made popular by Elon Musk created in the 80s to build something that is always available. Almost always available, it's not always available, but almost always available and it scales. It was used in the telecommunication system. Basically, they wanted something that is easier to use than C. And it works. Airlines still powers many of the telecommunication systems and now more and more others, like Rabbit MQ, Couch EB, but um, for example, um, WhatsApp is mostly built on top of Airlines. At least what I got from the Airlines. They made this actor more popular. <coughs> Basically, an actor is something like how object-oriented programming should have been done anyway. This is um, an actor is basically something that you can, um, can send a message to, you can react on the message with the example too, and do something with it. But then you can send it to another actor, etc. Et so it's kind of similar to a, to a class or an object, an object in an object in a language like Ruby, Python, Java, C++. And you send it a message when you make a message call on a Java object, like for example, um, to uppercase in Java on string, you're basically sending a message to that object. This is very similar to ACK. The important thing is here, um, if one piece of code sends a message to an actor, or one actor sends a message to another actor, they are independent of each other. So they only send messages, this can be a string, it can be a real object. Then with ACK you can send anything. In an ideal world, those messages are immutable. You can make them mutable, but that would be a bug. So you should keep state out of here. You can have state within the actor, but you should never transport state from one actor to the other. At least a mutable state. State is okay, but not mutable. The actor that receives a message doesn't even need to be running. It can wake up later, a couple of seconds. For example, if it's down, we'll see later how the fault tolerance system works. You can restart an actor, then it will start processing the messages again. Of course, if it's not available for hours and you keep sending messages, um, JVM will complain about insufficient memory. The sender sends the message and will to the mailbox, which acts as a mailbox, and then the sender is done. It doesn't even know if the actor really is able to process it. It's in the mailbox, and later, the next slide, this is a bit more. We have one actor that sends a message and it will put to a mailbox of the receiving actor, the blue one. Actually, the actor does not even send it to the actor directly. There's an actor ref, a reference around each actor. This is the one which we'll be using. You cannot or should not use an actor directly. There's always a reference around it. So this is decoupled. You send the message to the actor where to get in the mailbox. Then you have a dispatcher that takes out the messages from the mailbox. And then once the actor, the code we see an example later, on some JVM thread. In the end, it always executes on a Java long thread. That does not mean, if you may know that you, if you create too many threads on the JVM, it will well, not crash, but will be very slow. If you have an eight core machine and if you create hundreds of threads to write a code, you have a lot of context switching, that may not be the fastest way to do it. And if you create a million threads, you will get an out of memory exception. Very likely it is depending on your machine. So but if you have only eight threads on an eight core machine, the dispatcher can, depending on the dispatcher, there are different dispatchers we'll see later, can schedule the actors on those eight threads. If you have 10 million actors running, they will schedule them one after the other, but parallel all eight threads. So you do not need a thread for each actor. Actually, the ACA documentation says you can create, I think, two or three million actors for each JVM or a gigabyte of RAM, I think, and they will then run on the available threads you have. And you can configure how many threads you have. You can configure the thread for, for the dispatchers. You can say, OK, I have eight threads, I have 100 threads, depending on your machine. The default implementation is built for joint pool, and as far as I know, they will use the number of, they will create as many threads as their cores are with it, which is a good deal. <coughs> Act 
reactors can have state, but this is only state internal to the actor. You may know that when you now you read about concurrency, state is evil. At least the domain reference tell you. This is not completely true. Mutual state is evil, most of the time. You may still want mutual state, but not the cache, the concurrent hash map in Java. But even then, the concurrent hash map manages all the state handling for you. In an actor, you can have state within the actor. It can change with each message. But there will never be a race condition, because the actor itself is hiding all this from you. And the actor guys make sure that within an actor itself, you can never have a race condition. Unless you deliberately um, create state within your receive message, which will not be there. But this will be your own fault. Actors should do one thing at a time. They get a message, they process the message, and when this is done, they get the next message out of the methods. They will never get two messages in parallel and process them in parallel and mix the handle. One message at a time. An actor runs within an actor system. An actor system is like, yeah, maybe you shouldn't call it container <coughs> because everybody will think JBoss which is not bad itself, but this is not an application server. Arcus is not an application server, but the fire up an actor system, and you should, in most cases, have only one actor system for application, and within that actor system, all your actors want. You can have millions of actors within your actor system. They will, the actor system will manage all those actors, and you can complete it, you can give it a name, you can within the JVM, Start several actor systems, but I recommend using only one per application. It's probably better if you have several applications that do not really, um, they have independent tasks, it's probably better to run a separate JVM for each actor system. Otherwise, if one actor system needs a lot of memory, or needs a lot of CPU, and the other also, then there will be conflict. So it's better to run each actor system on a different. As I said, for each actor, there's an actor reference around it, and you never will work with the actor itself. An actor reference, basically, as I said, each actor reference is a subtype of the actor reference. We'll look at an example in a minute. You use this actor ref for all this message sending. You can access the actor ref if you need to. And you have a sender which you can use to send messages back. So if one actor A calls actor B, and actor B needs to send a reply to actor A, you can use the sender ref to send a message back. Let's switch the clips on short sample. This is a very simple actor. It's not As you can see, you have an animal actor. If you create an actor, you extend the actor class. And the really important thing is um, the receive method. The logging is something that comes from actor. With actors, you don't need to do much. No log for J configuration unless you want to. The receive message is the really important thing. Well, basically, you can send. This is the message that is called for each message that an actor receives. And you can pack a match within the receive method all the messages. This actor can write on a cat message and an eagle message. And you have the default. So if you send them something else, for example, here you send them 42, it will just print an unknown string. You can send them just strings or longs. I would not recommend doing that. It's better to create case classes like you have this object animal actor, this is a good way to do it. You create an object for the class animal actor, you create the case classes in there, and then you can send the case classes as a message to the actor. Case classes are immutable, so very good way to do it. You can use a sealed trait for animal. You want to make sure that nobody can extend animal anywhere. What do you do? Here in your main application, you create the actor system. 
this is some kind of a factory method, props, this is some kind of properties for an actor which you can put in stuff like from different configuration stuff or other things. This will create the actor and then you send the actor those objects, those messages. That get an email message, the email species with the cat, and you send them for So you can send that actor anything. In that case, it would just ignore it and put a warning. So you should, make, you should know what the actor can handle, actually. Don't send it anything, everything, but it can. This um, is a method name. It's not a special operator. It's Scala, Scala has very few special operators, almost anything. It's just a method. I think they choose the iteration one because it's the same as in Erlang. You can also use a send method. And if you use this in Java, and you can use almost anything in Arca also in Java, you will have to use the same method because Java will not work on I prefer to use the shorter method because this is very easy to read. But you can just say, okay, animal actor dot send and then e. <coughs> Questions about this? What you can do, an actor can, as I said, an actor can change the internal state. You can send them a message and then the actor can become something else. It may be in some situations that might be a good idea. For example, you have, let's say, you have some actor that does some security checks and your system recognizes that you have maybe some attacks. Because there's suddenly millions of logins from China, or most of the customers in the United States. You can send the security act a message and say, okay, now you have to become more careful and you have to do double check some security, maybe not just one password, but also some other credential. There's also an example for this in the clip. some monitoring. Depending on if you send them an info, monitoring message or something is weird, something is wrong, you can the actor react on it and it becomes something else. So if you send them a weird message, you can say become very nervous. If you send them an info method, it relaxes again. What you could use is in real life to say if you got a weird method, it's very nervous, and then you can say, okay, I count them, and if I get 10, I'll send a message to the system administrator or something like that. An email or ping it or ping it or something like that. Each of those if you count is method. They are like receive methods, they have this pattern matching, and they can do something um, that they need it. Then they become nervous, and if you uh, they relax and they get a weird message, they become nervous. If the nervous actor becomes an info message, it becomes relaxed again. And some, I don't meet this very often actually, I've never used this in production, but sometimes if you want to change the state of your actor, you can do it like this. This is completely thread safe. 
there's no global state, and because each message gets processed one after the other, you will never have two states at once. So this actor will either be in the nervous or the relaxed state. Will never be in two states at once. There will never be um, some synchronization problems or anything. Because the actor itself, those methods, they guarantee that the actor has one state and no other state. This is probably why it was built, why Upco was built. There's actually LennyCrash.com is the official team blog of the actor guys, of the actor guys. Very interesting website. This is not an Akka invention, this is how Erlang was built. And the guy who created Akka, Jonas Bonaire, he basically said Erlang is cool, but I want the JVM because all the libraries, deployment, stuff, performance, etc. And this is how yeah, if you create actors, there are always one within those kind of supervision tree. We'll look at an example how you can actually code this later. At the very top, there's always this root girl here. This is one by the actor, by the actor system. And then you have two branches in the tree. One is the system actor. This is what the actor itself does. And on the other side, you have the user actor. And the green surface there, you can put all your own actors. With your own actors, you can then create new branches within the tree. Let's look at an example. This may not be the, let's say you want to build an online shop. This may not be um, a competition for Amazon, but this is um, how it, something can work. Sometimes something writes your orders in a Cassandra database. Anybody uses Cassandra? You should. <laughs> <laughs> really good, really cool, really fast. Then you have some code that reads the orders from the Cassandra, creates um, an order object, sends it to the order service, it does some processing, maybe adding services <coughs> or stuff like that, computing the files, whatever, and then send it to my SQL database because if the, the Cassandra doesn't do transactions. No ACID in Cassandra. This is why it's so fast. But you say, okay, I want this in my SQL database for final order processing, SAP integration, stuff like that. So this is simple code. You have a bunch of you have an order service or the person reader. You get this on Cassandra. You process those orders, then you get the MySQL connection, and then you save it to MySQL. This is a sequential flow, everything is blocking one thing after the other. But this is not necessarily a good idea, because what do you do if something fails? If the MySQL connection fails, everything else, your, your thread fails, you can't do anything about it. Let's say your Cassandra connection is gone for two minutes, but you still have, you have already read 100, you have already read some order objects. You can process them, but then if anything fails in here, there's any exception. Maybe it's external code. The MySQL drive is something you don't write on your view. Down from the MySQL website. If you have a problem, it looks like this. You have only one flow of action. And if you have an exception, anywhere in that one thread, boom. The thread is gone. You can't do anything about it. But of course, you can do something and display an error message to someone. And can you can keep this and try again. But this is not really good because you are in your business logic. You want to do the business logic. You want to do what's necessary to process an order. You don't want to really care much about my secret database is failed, Cassandra database is failed. They don't fail that much, but it could happen. So. A bad idea would be to have two different flows. You have the normal flow of action where you do, where you have your normal actors, they do all the business logic, and you have a separate flow of action that supervises them. So they can say, okay, if one actor fails, I can do something about it. If the MySQL connection <coughs> fails, 
I don't draw an exception, but, or if there is an exception, but then I don't handle it myself, I let the supervisor handle it. And the supervisor can decide if the then is gone, or I just try again in five seconds, because it may be just a temporary network failure. They can say, well, I don't care if one order is gone, we have millions of customers going um, <laughs> for the next one. <laughs> Not a good business model. You can say, okay, maybe I just have to restart the act and it talks to Cassandra because there's some internal problem. The good thing is you can do all of those recovery, a lot about it, within your code. Many companies work like that, and if something is wrong, they alert an administrator and what they do. Hmm, Tomcat is not running well, let's just restart it, that helps. Often it helps. But if you want to be away <coughs> if you don't want to lose state between, um, you have a shopping cart between when there's a failure, you do not want to restart your Tomcat or your Acker application or Jamos or whatever all the time. You want it to run all the time. If you have an online job like Amazon and if you're down for 10 seconds, it will cost a lot of money. So if I don't put some money. Have you ever noticed Amazon really failed? Maybe some things failed, but the whole system well it failed. Google, I think they failed a couple of weeks ago. There was two hours of Google gone and the uh, world coming to an end. <laughs> but uh, you don't want to fail if you have something like that. So how could that work? This is one, there are many ways to do that. You know, there's a different um, patterns later. But this is one way how to do it. You have those, the green stuff, the green actors do your actual business, but they read from my SQL database, they process it, and they write either from Cassandra and they write it to another database. Actually, it might be a good idea to store all your orders in the Cassandra because it's much faster and much more reliable than the MySQL database and then you can lay that. But this is actually a good idea to do it. If I had to run an online shop, I might do it like that. And then you have those blue things, and they do all the supervision. So you can say, I call that reader, super, why is this the first one you call? That, that's the order reader actor to actually start reading from Cassandra. And then that order reader actor does not send the message directly to the process actor, but then I send it to the supervisor. So that one can do something if this thing fails. Can restart it. And then the process actor again writes to the supervisor. It's very simple to do to the one we have to just send it to the supervisor. There's a forward method in actors that you can use to just say, okay, I got this message, I don't have to do anything, just have to act the failure, just forward it to the real Let's look at an example. More code now, but let's look at the order we All this Cassandra connection, this is just a fake. Um, there's no real Cassandra board here. You have one method read order from a Cassandra database because it's like a list of basic order objects, and then you just have a few items in your order, a bunch of books. <coughs> now they combine some practice, in fact, each other, stuff like that. Of course, you would put scalar book in each other. I forgot to do that. So. And then, you have this order reader actor, what does it do? You have this Cassandra connection. This is what you can do. Um, in each actor, you have those callbacks. You have a pre-start, a post-start, you have a pre-stop and a post-stop. So you can do something. If you say, why this crashes, if they want to read like the crashes because there might be a problem with Cassandra, well, just create a new, when I restart, just create a new connection to Cassandra. The connection may be gone, the connection pool may be full, there might be some problem in the network, okay? I, if I have to restart, give me a new connection. Might also say, okay, give me a new connection and send an email to our database administrator because they have to look into it. When you receive, when they receive yourself, all you do is read the words. And then you have a company. 
bunch of different exceptions. We have, for example, a broken connection exception. We have a broken disk and exception. This is two, two things that can go wrong. If Cassandra is gone for a while, maybe you have just have to restart, maybe just reconnect because the connection pool is broken. If the disk is broken, well, so should have, because I'm always running a cluster and it shouldn't be a problem, but let's assume in that case, if the disk is broken, you cannot continue because you need a new disk. Of course, you won't do that. You have several disks or waves. Well, Cassandra doesn't need to wait, but if Cassandra cluster will have a replica, so if this is really a problem, you know, you can send the correct way, but let's assume for the example that in that case you have to fail. And this is where the supervisor comes in. As you can see, a supervisor is just an actor. Supervisor creates a new reader actor, and then you override the supervision strategy. In that case, all the ones that you need. This is a good, good way to several different supervision strategies. But this, this demo, what we just do here is if you have a broken disk exception, it doesn't work because you also have a summer. But what it does in that case, it stops. If an actor fails, if it crashes, they can get this terminated method. The supervisor can react in the terminated method if the reader actor fails. If the reader actor fails, because of a null point exception or something like that, we can listen to them and we can send self, it would be the supervisor himself, and the poison pill object is basically says, kill yourself. <laughs> Sometimes, if you look at, if you remember the picture, there might be things. If Cassandra is not available for a short moment, you might say, okay, let's restart, try again. Sometimes you say, okay, I stop an actor, then start from scratch. Sometimes you have an irrecoverable recover, error. From disk is gone, if your everything is gone, you cannot do anything, you may have to say, okay, I'm done, I stop. Again, if something like a telecommunication system really completely stopping is not a good idea. But for many applications, sometimes you have errors which you cannot recover from, but then you have to stop. So hopefully then somebody will be alerted and will look at the problem. But what you can also say, I try to reconnect to Cassandra 20 times, and if I can't get a new connection after 10 minutes, I'll stop. We had problems at work, for example, with a switch. And the, or the main switch is failed, and then all, almost all our network was gone. We cannot accept anything. In that case, there's no point in trying again and again, just polluting the network with traffic. If all the admins want to do is a clean network without any traffic to see where the problem is. So, the other actors, the other, they work, they basically work the same way. So I'm not showing the code. This is, they all work the same way. They create something that call the next actor and or let's look at the process actually. Because they have broken this. Again, this receives an order object, then this does some processing, calculate the price. Just adding some taxes here. And then you send it to the wire. Then wire actually saves the order. Again, you have different exceptions. Invalid order exception, and I can say if the invalid, if the order is invalid, this is a good example. If the order is invalid, so if I read from Cassandra a broken order, for example, the email address of the customer is missing, and I cannot maybe okay, then I cannot process the order because I cannot contact the customer anymore. I can say, okay, ignore it, because you would lock it to some file or something like that. But it means, okay, if there's an invalid order, we assume it basically drops the message but continues working. But that one order will be gone. Okay, okay. okay. this is the supervisor's what I told that earlier about forwarding. The supervisor has an instance of the processor actor 
And if you receive some message, any message, you just forward it to your real actor. And that actor does the business logic, it does all the work itself. What's your difference to the former actor supervising this is all for one? Do we have one for one strategy? There are, different, there are different supervision strategies which you can use. In that case, it doesn't make a difference because it's only one actor. Very good, in other words, in there is. I think it's about. Yeah. What to do with all children? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This is if you have, you can. In, the, in our case, one actor has one children. The supervisor creates the normal actor. And if you create a child actor, you're always the supervisor automatically. You can create only one um, actor, and in that case, this makes sense one for one. But you can create the thousand actors. If you say, I have, I'm the supervisor of the MySQL writer, I want to write. In parallel to my sequel with thousand different actors, don't do it, we'll kill it anyway. But if you want to have a, can have a thousand actors, and then if one fails with a broken my secret connections, all children will stop. If you have one for one and you have then only that one particular actor. If you want to see a really good talk, that would be it. He said nothing, doesn't even mention Scarlet Arkets or about Ellen. But Joe Armstrong is the creator of Ellen, is a really, 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 really funny and very, very smart guy. And in that talk, he said, he fixed the error somewhere else. And this is exactly what we did. If we realize that there's a problem with the MySQL connections, we let the supervisor fix the problem. We do not fix it ourselves. The slides will be on my GitHub account. I'll show you at the end so you can get all the addresses. As I said, we have several options for a supervisor. You can restart it. Assume you can stop it. Sometimes you say, oh, I cannot really handle it. I don't know what to do with the problem. Then you can escalate it and then it moves up. One node in the, in the supervision tree. And then Hopefully the act above can handle it. If not, again it'll be above. If you do not handle it at all and it goes to the very top, boom. The actor system will stop because then you have an exception that nobody's handling and the JVM says, like, I don't know what to do with this. Goodbye. So you should at least at some point handle it. Again, this is um, a tree how it can look like. I think it has a name, this pattern is called the error kernel, it's, at least it's called in some books. The good thing about all these tree structures is that all those nodes can be really independent of each other. They can even, as we will see later, run on different machines. So, if their node fails, for example, if the Cassandra connection fails, well, you have, or this is maybe, you have on the other side, you have another Cassandra connection of a pool. Maybe someone else, you can say, because I'm not going to but I can also get the orders from another database because you're a bit paranoid and say, okay, I don't trust Cassandra, also write the Redis. You can still add your system running. If only the wire thing fails, the rest of the blue stuff is still working. And you can restart it, resume, and maybe recover after a couple of minutes. Or you can say, okay, I cannot handle this, that whole part is gone. But if the blue part is still working, maybe it does not need the red part. It shouldn't be that better. So you can still continue with the blue part. This allows you to build extremely fault tolerant systems. Because you can always, if you don't know what to do with a problem, uh, level above, one node above, might know how to do it. And as long as the node at the very top is very stable, the system will always be running and be as good as possible. You can recover from problems without a lot of human interaction, without a lot of hand holding, like in restarting new stuff. Of course, maybe sometimes you have to restart stuff, 
Well, if Cassandra is gone, for example, you can just restart Cassandra, and you do not have to restart the whole system. Of course, in that case, it's very important that the node at the very top is very simple. There should be no business logic at all in it. It should be, just be there, very simple, almost no logic at all, just do the supervision of the other things. Because if that's if the one above, it's very, very, um, let's say, instable, then the whole system, if the one at the top crashes, everything will be gone. So the one at the top should always be with the only one. As we said, if you remember, we said, Akka has a whole bunch of mailboxes, an actor has a mailbox, and you send the message to the mailbox. Just want to show you that there are different mailboxes. The default one is Java, you can compile it to call it name queue. It's an extremely efficient implementation of a queue. Um, I think if you read from the queue, it does block. There's, this, there's no synchronized <coughs> in it. It's very, very efficient. One problem, it's an unbounded mailbox. This is the default, there's a good reason this is the default. But it's an unbounded mailbox. So if you send it, let's say 100 messages per second, and you, the actor can only handle 10, then you will run into another memory problem. Still, you should use this as a default, because if you run into other memory problems all the time, you probably have a design problem in the application, architectural problem, or some bug. Because you may just need to create more actors on a more powerful machine learning. You can say I want a bounded mailbox. You, say, you can configure, you can say, okay, I want to have at most 100,000 messages, and then it will block. Or just, just get rid of them. You can say I have priority mailboxes. So if you say, okay, I send it messages, and they have some watering, then they will be well according to the priority. This is like a priority blocking queue in Java I think this is actually what's on Do normal, there are some, I think, implementations where you can actually say the mailbox should save the messages to disk or maybe even to annoy the message. I don't know, but you could do it. Or you can write your own mailbox. If you say I need something special, you can do it. Dispatchers, dispatchers is the stuff that takes uh, code that takes a message from the mailbox and run it on a thread. The default dispatcher is called dispatcher, or maybe not the best choice for name, but it works it's based on the fourth choice that was introduced with Java 7, but Akka also works for it, I know, with Java 6 because they provide for join of the library. They say Java 7 is simply faster, so if you, unless you have a really good reason to stay with Java 6, and I can't think of any use Java 7 for the production. You have the pin dispatcher. Pin dispatcher says, okay, I want to really run this on one particular thread. This is not, most of the time it's not a good idea, but sometimes you want to have all the control, and this might be a good balancing dispatcher can balance it across different actors, if they have, if they have a child actors, and you can say, okay, that one isn't busy. Use that one. Calling thread dispatcher is something you should use if at all only unit tests. Because if, if you send actor A sends a message to actor B, all will be run on the same thread. This is not what you want if you want to decouple your, your actors. So this is good for unit testing. It's a really bad idea for production. If you want to write your own dispatch again, you can do that. Routing. If you say you have one parent actor and many, many child actors, you can say, I want to distribute them all the child actors, and you, have a, you can use a router. There are different implementations, we'll see the list shortly. And you can use that to distribute the messages across the whole bunch of routing. Routing is done on the calling thread. In fact, it's actually a good idea, because you want the routing to be as efficient as possible. It's an actor, a router is an actor, but all it does is say, OK, I have this message. This is my routing policy, send it to the next actor. There's nothing else running around. You have a whole bunch around Robin, random around the smallest mailbox, they can detect others. I have 10 actors, the other one has a huge mailbox, the other one has a small mailbox, just send it to the one smallest mailbox. Broadcast router, 
consistent hashing, hashing and again, ready to go. Remote access, I have not used this introduction yet, but you can, an actor, each actor has a, has a unique address, an actor path. Just a few L from it, and you can, if you're on your own machine, it's like user, order actor, etc., etc., you can also say this runs on a different machine. You can just change it, you have to deploy your actor on another machine, and this is just configuration change. So this is mostly transparent to the user. Of course, um, you should realize that you still have a network underneath if you do it like that. And if you have the wonderful paper, the seven fallacies of distributed computing, you should. One of the fallacies is that the belief that the network is always reliable. I haven't seen such a network. If you have, you can do it. So you can use remote actors if you need to. It helps to distribute all your well, so there's many machines, but you should keep in mind that there's a network underneath your code. I have not used this at all. New into two is a cluster setup. It's where it's, it's using the Gossip protocol. It's actually pretty similar to Cassandra. So you can say I have a cluster of actors distributed to several machines. This one machine fails, all this stuff is still working. A lot of more stuff is coming. You petition your actors, you have quorum reads and write and all this stuff. I have not used this at all in production, um, and I have to admit I do not know much about it. It's all in the actor documentation. There will be more examples and more stuff will be coming. If you need more information, I encourage you to go to the left and read this for yourself. Futures. I'm not talking much about futures right now, but I will show you how you can use futures actors. Actually, the question mark is a method. So sometimes you say, you say what you want to do, you have an actor send a message to another actor and want to get something in return. You can, as I said, you can use the sender in an actor and send a message back to the sender. But this can be in a different thread. So if you react on the sending actor, on the message you got from the receiver, you do not know which call it was. So if you send, let's say, an order object and you want to get a new order object with the calculated price, you do not know if you send that order object, get back an order object, but you can, they do not match. You can say, I send 10,000 order objects from the sender to the receiver, then you get back 10,000 order objects in 10,000 different messages. And if you want to say, okay, but in that particular thread, and in my act, I want to send this message, and then I want, I want to send this order object from the sender to the receiver, and I want to get back the new order object with the calculated price and tax and everything. Then the future is the way to go. And it's very simple to use. Actually, the future stuff in Scarlet. Oh, let's look at this first and just play one point. This is something, this is a very simple sender and receiver. You have an echo actor, you have a receive method, and all it does is sends back the message to the receiver. And the sender actor creates the SDA to receive. Well, there's a scheduler, and there's a scheduler with him really cool. And you say, got it right now. Every two seconds, call is random, and the runner just sends a random message as to the echo actor, and all you do, you get back this, the echo, and then it's just random. So, in that case, you do not have any context. You send something, you get it back. But if you want to get an answer to the particular message you sent, you need something like a fusion. Okay. 
Okay. Acker came up with, I think it was Acker 1.2 or something, came up with a new implementation of futures. It uh, was a very good implementation of futures, but they realized after a while that there are many, many different future implementations in Scala, like Finney from Twitter, and many others, like Lyft, I think, has its own future. Then they took the futures from Acker and also took ideas from other future implementations and created what is called SIP14, Scala Improvement Process 14, and they created a new implementation of futures. And this they now, this is at the default starting with Scala 2010. And they moved it out of ACA to the Scala standard. Also the ACA actors now replace the old Scala actors. Scala had actors in the, in the standard library, but there are always problems, I think, with performance and stuff like that. And the ARC actors are better, so if you still have an old Scala book that talks about actors, don't use the old actor from the Scala scenario anymore, use ARC. And for futures, use those, the new futures. So how do you use it with actors? It's pretty simple. Let's say you have an actor from a database, you read a customer. You get back a future from the database, and all you do is here you have to receive master, and then you read the future, you have a future from the database object, and you want to send it back to the caller, and this is where the pipe to sender is the method you want to use, you just have to import it. You have this ACA pattern, you have ASK in PIP. ASK is the question mark in PIP, is the PIP2 method. And what that ACA does, it types it back to the sender. And in that case, let's see how the sender works. This is in that case the main method. I have I create this DB actor, and I send it a message. In that case, I do not use the exclamation mark, but the question mark, send it, the customer ID, get back something, and then I have my future, and then I can say, okay, on complete, this is one of the many ways how to use future, like the callback, you can be on complete, if it's successful, like a customer, you can always deal with failures in future, and then if there's a failure, well, something went wrong. There are many more ways, if you go to my GitHub account and see it again, you can get the slides and the example from the future talks I gave a couple of weeks earlier. They're very really easy to use. There are a few things we have to be careful about. I think it's the best future implementation for I think much more powerful than the Java 7 future. Java 8 will get a completed, completed future object which will be similar to the Scala future. But this is much more powerful than the Java 7. So, the most, a few guidelines for ARCA before we're done, and then I can continue with this stuff. Don't block whatever you do. You don't want to block in any actor, because if you block, you basically, your system doesn't scale anymore. Well, sometimes you have to block if you call a uh, old database, JDBC is blocking normally, so you have to deal with it in some way. But then you should maybe you put the blocking calls in one actor, Within that supervision tree, and if that fails because the moment you can still have the rest of the application for it. Within an actor or something, you should never block. If an actor blocks and you keep sending messages, hmm. isolate very important. <laughs> um, share mutable state is mostly bad. Don't put state in your messages and isolate the actors. The actors should never. If you have some global singleton object and have a lot of stuff in it, the actors can get can call you, you can do anything you want in an actor, but you can do with Scala or Java. Don't do it. Do not use an actor to reference some global mutual state. Very simple. I had many years ago I inherited some Java code that had I think it was some three or four thousand lines of one giant switch. <laughs> that was fun. 
Yeah, because you're still running. It's modified a bit. <coughs> but you can do basically the same thing. Nobody is stopping you from creating a receiving method that pattern matching and matches 100 different type of messages. So you can say an order message, you can say a security message. You can put everything in one actor. Of course, this is really, really stupid. Because, first of all, nobody can read your code, and it won't scale. So an actor should do one thing. If you have an order actor, an order, that example, if you have an order reader actor, it should actually read the order, not write it. And the order processing actor, maybe should not do user management. So one thing, one actor. Basically like a class. A class should do one thing. A message should do one thing. Same with that. If you want books, there are a whole bunch of books now available or in the making. This is a good one. It's still being written. Uh, I think eight or nine chapters are available. I like this a lot. Very good explanations of many things. How to bring Akka into production, has many patterns, etc. That's a very good book. Again, very good book. It's already done. It's available. You can buy it on Amazon or in the PDF. It covers, this one covers Akka 2.1, and the other one might cover Akka 2.2. It's not very done, so maybe they cover 2.2. This has absolutely nothing to do with ACA. It was written in 2006 by everyone who does any concurrency on the JVM, no matter if it's ACA or Cynic or Scarlet or whatever. You don't really talk and you make a mistake. ACA has one of the best documentations of all open source projects, hundreds of pages, and good content. Really, really good, really, really easy to read, lots of examples. Highly recommend it. And they have separate version of the documentation for Scala and another one for Java. Everything I showed you today can be done with Java. So if you want to introduce Akka to your company, but you cannot use Scala for whatever reason because nobody wants to use it or management home oh, for Scala developers or all these other weird reasons not to use Scala. You can do this with Java. Does it make is it fun? Yeah, maybe not. But you can use it with Java. Everything here works with Java. And any other JVM message. If you, are, if you have a Clojure shop, you can use this with Clojure. If you have a Groovy shop, you can use it with Groovy. As long as it runs in the JVM, and you can access Java code, of course the Groovy or the Clojure code would use the Java API. They can. So you can use this from any JVM language that has access to Java. Code. There's a few more examples on this website, and also there's the futures examples all on this website. You can download it, do whatever you want with it. Of course, this is no production code, so if you have to order and say you boss, okay, and we can now make the new Amazon. This is the code deployed. It's your own boss. Questions? Maybe just a remark. Um, if I remember correctly from the ACA documentation, they distinguish between state and behavior. And what you have shown to change the receive method is in their terminology more the behavior. And state should be then the something like a var, for example, that you can change. But yeah, you're right. Yeah. I think that, yeah, it's some kind of state, but it's actually behavior is a better word. And I think it's as the same documentation. Mm -hmm. If you have not used the ACA before, try it out. It's relatively easy to use. Of course, you run into some problems. The mailing list is extremely helpful. You always get an answer very fast. There's a lot of stuff now on Stack Overflow. The books are very helpful. Um, this is not a GitHub 0.1 project where you have to go through all the source code to find out what it's actually doing. It's very stable. They have very high standards when it comes to code quality. It's one of the best open source project, I think the code quality is very good. I have seen a lot of this is really good code. So it's just a lot of fun to use and for many things Arca is just the right tool. As I said, not for everything but for most applications. So, no.